How can we define political Speaker, expansionism? Speaker, the progress towards deep so global economic integration has been so far and we've benefited the elite. All right, everyone, welcome to Beyond 7 Minutes, a student-led podcast that has been hosted by the IUM English Debate Club. Our goal is simple. We attempt to connect all of our listeners to intellectuals worldwide. Today's topic is going to be on student journalism. And who better than Brian Wong to talk to about this? Now, for those of you who aren't clear on what Brian Wong has done, Brian Wong is a year two master's philosophy. Am I, am I getting this correct? And yes, Phil and right. candidate yeah, at right. Boston College and in the University of Oxford. He has graduated with a first class honors from Pembroke College in Oxford with a BA in philosophy, politics, and economics. Brian yeah. is also an incredible writer. Brian's writings have appeared in Time Magazine, Times Higher Education, Fortune, Diplomat Magazine, South China Morning Post, a personal favorite, Asia Times, Hong Kong Economic Journal, and the blogs of the American Philosophical Association and the Oxford Euro Centers of Practical Ethics. Brian was the Vice President of Economists Without Borders Oxford, a founding fellow of Governance Partners, uh, and a co-founder of Citizen Action Design Lab, a Hong Kong-based think tank. Now, Brian is also a competitive debater, having debated twice, and uh, sorry, had, having judged twice the grand finals and debated plenty of times, uh, including the semifinals of the World Universities Debating Championship. This took place, I believe, last year. Correct, Brian? Thailand, which was six months ago. So, um, uh, so what we're going to focus on today is particularly the Oxford Political Review. You are the founding editor-in-chief of the Oxford Political Review. So the Oxford Political Review, for those of you who aren't familiar, has done some incredible interviews with some incredible people around the world. Um, I'll just name a few in particular. For example, there was an interview with Dr. Jim Green, a NASA chief scientist. It was very interesting because the conversation heavily revolved around life outside of this planet, uh, in outer space, in Mars, so what have you. Secondly, the Oxford Political Review recently published an article titled All the Terrorism We Cannot See, Misogyny, Whiteness, and Radicalization. This was particularly interesting because we don't normally label these things terrorism, correct, Brian? Uh, it, depends. it depends heavily on whom you ask, I suppose, because I think the definition of what constitutes terrorism varies from person to person, especially depending on if you are indeed part of the demographic that's targeted by it or afflicted indeed Correct. by conditions that you can analogize with terrorism. But I apologize for, for digressing. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries, no worries. Uh, number three, um, so among several of the interviews, another one was also with Noam Chomsky. Um, Brian, how did that come about? How did you reach Noam Chomsky for an interview? And, and the reason is I previously messaged him in the past talking about or asking him about his thoughts on a few questions I had, residual questions about his manufacturing consent and all that. And we, we developed a bit of a correspondence pattern, followed up with that, or followed up on that rather, of course, with uh, more questions through email and asked him, just out of the blue, you know, I'm running, or a few friends of mine and I have found this publication, would you be interested in getting interviewed? And he said, let me think about it. That was in March, 2019. So mm -hmm. after one year of waiting, we finally got a positive response from uh, Noam. So that was pretty uh, incredible. And then, Obviously, the interview came about in February. After a lot of delays and technical difficulties, we finally made it happen. Wow, that, that, that's actually quite incredible. Uh, hopefully, we can get him for beyond seven minutes at some point. Uh, yeah, so the first question that I would ask you is, Brian, how are you? I'm well. Um, I'm as well as you'd possibly be. Uh, I'm quite busy. The schedule is currently packed with a mixture of running a few of my think tanks, carrying out a few pro bono initiatives for youth, in Hong Kong, and also juggling that, or between that rather, and also running OPR alongside my wonderful team, and also trying to maintain my career, whatever there is of a so-called career, in writing, <laughs> uh, in writing about Hong Kong and China, writing about you know questions of public philosophy, and finally uh, writing on behalf of hopefully student rights of foreign international students studying in the US and UK, which are all areas I'm very much fascinated about and interested in. Is that an OPR project or? No, no, none of this is to do with OPR. It's just directly to do with sort of my own journalistic slash public 
uh, commentary career, which, which isn't even in practice, in my opinion, that much of a career than a side hobby, because in fact, my so-called career is academic. So I, I'm an aspiring academic. I'm interested in questions of historical inequalities and justices and colonialism, as well as right. what contemporary relevance these questions might bear or have for us in the modern age in that sense. Well, that's one hell of a side hobby. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was a hobby I think evolved largely out of necessity because um, it was halfway through last year when a friend of mine approached me and said, Brian, you've been writing a lot for SCMP. Have you thought about branching out and reaching out uh, to, to different audiences, including ones that don't conventionally read the SCMP? Uh, have you thought about you know, going international or more international with your writing? And I said, you know, what, what prospects do you think I have with that? And they said, why not think about the publications that you could write for and just aim, aim for them? Because if you have something to say, and this is what my friend said to me, and I deeply echo this, if you have something to say, there's no reason why you should self-censor where you say it, how you say it, and what to say. I think there are always questions about you know, uh, the different manifestations of forms in which what you say can come across. So that's a matter of packaging. Right. But that's quite different from saying, okay, I don't, want to, I don't want to talk about this issue at all. And I think that's something that's quite regretful in the sense that there's a trend of self-censorship and also folks refusing or being reluctant Definitely. to write about topics they may not be able to. And obviously there's, in practice, you know, ideology and ideation or, or rather idealistic imaginaries aside, there are always reasons why we might be wary of putting things in a particular way. To get a point across, to make a convincing argument, you have to change and adapt the way you write. But independent of that, if you decide in the first place to not even try write, but instead, what you're going to do is to sort of shut yourself off from the world at large because you fear that what you say is not of value or doesn't have that purport or doesn't have insight. Then you're depriving not just yourself of very valuable opportunities, but also you're depriving the world the right and opportunity to hear from you, about you, and hear your very particular voice. So long-winded rant aside, I then decided to pitch my writings on sort of topics very close to my heart back then and still are to a variety of publications, including Time Magazine and also Time Higher Education. So that's how my writing a career or, or semi-career came about. Really. Yeah, that's, that's actually pretty interesting because there, are, there is a trend to suggest that more and more students around the world in universities have actually started to get involved with I, either be it, for example, student newsletters, student podcasts, or even article writing where students actively voice out their opinions, be it on politics, be it on economics, and the point that you raised was extremely important, which is if you have something to say, you should say it. Otherwise, you'll be depriving yourself of it. And this is where I come back to the OPR, because the OPR is probably a pretty good example of student journalism and its potential, right? So the first question that I have for you is, what is student journalism to you? Well, I, I hate to be a downer here, but I'd say um, I don't actually see OPR as a student journalist enterprise in a strict sense, in the sense that obviously it's run and edited and managed by students, but what we aim to do is to effectively create a magazine or publication along the lines of, say, Granta, London Review of Books, The Point, uh, and just a variety of publications that straddle the professional slash student-driven media space, like the space between the two ends, because in our opinion, at the end of the day, we, we don't want to claim to be, because that would be quite pompous as of now, to be like the Atlantic. We're not the Atlantic, and we should face it to that fact, mm -hmm. at the very least, you know, today. But concurrently, we have a unique niche where we draw together academics, young, early stage researchers and academics, that is, and also late stage postgrads, and also some undergrad students, in putting together pieces and managing pieces, and producing, I think, commentaries and writings that really effectively channel, hopefully, their academic insights and apply them to, you know, engaging with real, real life issues and real life debates. So that, that's effectively, the, the mission of OPR. And I'd say this is different from student journalism, both in terms of the caliber or, or the general timbre of writings produced. So not to sound snobbish, but I think student journalism has a very different niche. So they specialize more in you know, instantaneous, accurate, and obviously high quality yeah. reporting. They also offer platforms for aspiring, say, undergraduate students or younger students to write and share what they think are important and relevant to the world. And that's really, really important. I don't want to diminish or in any ways denigrate you know, the importance of student journalism. But I'd say OPR is probably different at this point in time and, and also at the time of inception even from the stereotypical standard student publication out there. So that is why 
I, 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 I make a differentiation there or differentiate between the two. But going back to what you said, um, or it's, uh, about what exactly student journalism is about, for me, it's two things. One, it must be student driven, that yeah. students aren't here to be employed or hired as freelance workers or simply as the subservient service distributing or disseminating what others want them to write. They have the autonomy and agency to create their own pieces. And to the extent answering to others, those to whom they're answering to, and I put that in quotation marks, are also students. So I think that that's very important, right? Because the moment students become interns or, or basically uh, ghostwriters, that's no longer student journalism. That's just you know, students being conscripted unethically for unpaid internships or, or, or just, you know, for, for journalists to get internships. The second aspect, though, is journalism. And here, I think journalism, it ultimately strikes at the heart of what journalists ought to do in contemporary discourse. And in my opinion, journalism is not just about transcribing or reporting the truth. It's also about taking some sort of stance. And here I'm quoting from Nicole Hannah-Jones, whose project on uh, researching and analyzing the persisting inequalities and persisting racial injustices in America today has come under criticisms lately for being allegedly biased, to which she said, and I'm paraphrasing here, so don't, don't claim that this is a direct quote. Yeah. She claims, or she rather, you know, quite resiliently rebukes the claim and said, look, guys, at the end of the day, every journalist, all journalists, necessarily of these within the work some degree of subjectivity necessarily takes a stance on political issues and they don't or they claim not to do so rather then they're really just you know betraying the very ideals of journalism of holding power to account and checking against power and borrowing the quote here in that I, I slightly differ from that I, I do disagree in that I think fundamentally there's more to journalism than just political advocacy or political campaigning and taking an active stance on important issues. There are also variants of journalism that are purely fact-based and comparatively less tainted by you know, subjective or ideological slash sectarian biases, and that's still valuable contribution. But what I want to emphasize, and this is where I do fundamentally converge with Nicole, we shouldn't conceptualize of journalism as just a so-called factually factual reporting enterprise, because that would be so boring. It's a bit like asking an AI to summarize, you know, a chess game, and they can do that perfectly, but is that journalism? Hell no, right? An AI can't tell you the emotions of the players involved. An AI can't tell you the intricacies and thought processes that underpin each of them. An AI that talks about the past cannot make real what the present is, whereas journalism reveals truth about the present through engagement with the past and translation or transduction rather of the latter into the former. So I think that's sort of how I would conceptualize I or imagine yeah. journalism. I mean, yeah, there's definitely a lot more to journalism, specifically student journalism, but I want to point out one distinction that you made just now, where you said that what would constitute student journalism is an organization that is largely run by students, right? So you don't have students working for like small part-time jobs or like nothing like internships, right? It's largely run by students. So coming back right. to the OPR, what's the OPR structure like? Is it a student-led organization? Yeah, so it, it used to be a purely student-led organization. Now it's effectively run by a group of Oxford alumni, both recently graduated and also graduated, or those who have graduated say, a few years back, and also current postgrad students alongside undergrads. So it's edited and managed exclusively by Oxford ex or current yeah. students. But you note that the ex part is important because I think that lends both the publication some degree of realism and groundedness in terms of being connected to the world at large, as well as the necessary and extensive experience that allows us to cut, hopefully, a notch above many other publications that you might see out there in terms of just doing our job, but also doing our job with rigor. And what is our job and how is it different from, say, most student journalist publications out there? Now, I'm very wary of this this tendency on the part of some to be meretriciously obsessed with high status and snobbery. So I don't want to sound snobbish, and I think this is not snobbery, but I think where OPR stands out or differs from other publications you might see from actual student journalists is that we have different foci. Our focus lies fundamentally with integrating political commentary, writing and analysis with both current affairs and academic theory. Journalism and reporting is a side gig that we run alongside it, but most of our pieces are not you know, claims like reports on what's going on around the world, but second order analyses yeah. of what's going on around the world. Whereas student journalism, and I think this is within their telos, and it is within a remit to do so, you know, prioritizes verisimilitude, 
prioritizes instantaneity, instantaneity rather, of the coverage of the reporting. And whilst we're therefore we're both sort of managed and organized by students, I guess, that's where OPR differs from many of these other publications that you might think of yeah. you know, an association. So the difference so a lot of the differentiation has to do with the nature of the content, right? So it's two things. It's the structure, but it's also the content right. that they go. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, exactly. the content surrounding OPR largely concerns political discourse, right? I mean, this is from what I've witnessed in social media. Now, given yeah. that that's the case, presumably most of the individuals working at the OPR would also be interested in world politics. So I want to know specifically about you. At what point did world politics become something that interests you? Well, I think it certainly had a lot to do with my, uh, <laughs> well, you, you know, uh, the, the life of a life of a debate debater, uh, the, the yeah. wimpy the diary of a wimpy debating kid. I think I started, you know, getting really interested in world politics from a very young age because right? I was a nerd, and that actually predates my involvement with debating in the first place. And that's, I personally thought, you know, the world is so large, and yet I knew so little, and I was not particularly sociable. We're still not very social very socially awkward and introverted in my early years in high school. And therefore, what could I have turned to? I turned automatically, as you will, to world politics. And more precisely, actually, to start, starting with Chinese politics. And then moving on from Chinese politics to all parts and quarters of the world, including Meiji Restoration Japan and the Showa period and how to interact with the Taisho period, which I then learned about formally in IB. <laughs> and then also European history, the medieval ages, the Black Death and all of that. Why did I read? And indeed, I kept reading and reading and reading. Well, the short and tragic answer is, and, uh, and the honest answer is, I had very few friends. So I just spent most of my time reading, tucked away in a corner in the library, enjoying my little downtime with myself. And then obviously debating kick-started a sort of upward uh, ascent in terms of the amount I read and also the range I read. I started reading The Economist, started reading The New York Times, and I would say a Form 3, Form 4 student. And gradually, that just picked up traction and gained pace as we went along. So that's, I guess, how I got interested in work politics. Because to me, coming from a city that's so international in demographics and yet often so myopic in its, in its uh, publicly espoused ethos in terms of public political discourse here, I've always been struck by how little we actually knew about the world around us. So I wanted to find out more. I was not satisfied by what I knew. And I guess that's... Yeah what motivated me to keep reading. That's definitely important. Um, I mean, that's a powerful motivating factor. And obviously, the debating adds on to it because it's something you're obviously compelled to do as a debater over time. But do you, do you reckon this is something that more students should get interested in? Because it's some, something about world politics is either extremely attractive to some people, and the idea of it is also equally unattractive to another group of individuals who feel as though, as students, they have very little influence on the world around them anyways. So they would much rather just get up on, you know, get about their day without reading up on the world. What do you have to say to individuals like that? Well, in all honesty, uh, if you would excuse my crudeness, at the end of the day, most people in the world are bloody helpless in terms of changing the world about them. If we always think about how large our impact is, you know, we may as well all just bloody pack it in, call it a day and go home and sleep. Because honestly, you... Or, or, or I, uh, all of us, you know, we can't change the world. But we can change important aspects and facets of the world. Everyone can. And this starts from a young age, you know. A 16-year-old girl could be spearheading a movement fighting against one of the worst existential crises we've ever had in the history of mankind. 16-year-old, you know. Yes, she's the daughter of, I don't know, an actress, and she also likes riding a, uh, what, what is it, expensive trains? I don't know. But she is, after all, an icon, Greta Thunberg. A, a young girl who survived, say, a, a terrible, horrifying instant at a young age in the hands of barbarians who wanted to prevent her from going to school. She survived it. She persisted. And she went to Oxford. She's graduated recently. She's called Malala. And she's a brilliant, brilliant person and very charming in real life, too. And I think the reality is we can all make a difference no matter how small. Start with the homeless around you. Start with issues of poverty. It's distributing masks in times of epidemics. Volunteering at your local center. Then you might talk about policy changes. Then you might talk about governing a city. Then you might talk about transforming politics and making life better for everyone. But I think, in my opinion, you have to pick your battles. And you have to pick your battles and then fight them. The reason why I say pick your battles is for far too long, 
I had been, as with many others, ridden with the thought, ridden with the guilt that I could be doing so much more. I was therefore dot 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 because I was not doing that useless. But that's not true. We can pick our battles, we can pick where we're fighting, we can pick the arenas where we can matter and make an actual difference and then follow through. Because I think there's nothing that annoys me more than people that say, you want to save the whole damn world and you do nothing about it. And yeah. then you look down on those who do something, albeit not you know, as grand or grandstanding-esque as, as the person who says they can save the world. And then you look down on them and say, you're not saving the world. What are you doing there? And then the response I would give automatically is, oh, what the hell are you doing? What are you doing? Tosser. Right. So I think it's important to recognize that, obviously, yeah. th there are limits to what we can do. Let's face it, there are limits. Not everyone can be Greta Thunberg. Not everyone can be Malala. Correct. Not everyone can be, I don't know, inspiring activist 101. That's not the point. The point is, can you do your, the best? Can you give it your best shot within the realm of possibility? And I, I think for me, there's nothing I loathe more than those who consistently insist that they can do everything outside the realm of the possible and then blame those who want to focus on the realm of the possible whilst doing it well. I don't care how large or how small your impact is. I care about you, where your heart lies, where your motivations are, and fundamentally if you're succeeding. And that to me is more important than how grand your dreams are and how visionary you might be. And this, this sounds contrary to popular wisdom because folks would be like, who are you to tell me that I can't become Cinderella? Well, for one, Cinderella is fake. And unless you are also fake, which you may well be by asking that question, I would suggest that you probably are not someone who wants to become Cinderella. Yeah. So that's my response there. Yeah, that's, that, I mean, you actually raised a very good point there. And I think that, that was also echoed in Sun Tzu's book, Art of War, where it's like, you pick the battles you can fight and you're more likely to become victorious. And that's extremely important. We should pick the causes that, are, that have a higher possibility of success, albeit they might be small, but these are the things that we should go for. But then it comes back to reading, doesn't it? Because in order to find any cause to stick with or to solve any problem, you're sort of going to need to be aware that it exists. Um, of course, with something like COVID-19, almost everyone is going to be aware of it one way or another, but there are a lot of more niche problems surrounding us that we, surrounding us that we aren't aware of insofar as we don't read. Um, yeah, so I actually agreed with everything you said. That was an incredibly important thing to raise. Now, Another thing that I want to ask is the process of setting up the OPR. Can you tell us a bit about your experience and the effort that goes into running an organization like this, just in case there might be students watching that might be interested to start something similar from their universities? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I would say there were broadly three stages. Stage one was just the inception phase where alongside a very good, few, few very close and good friends of mine, we sat down one day. Uh, I think a, a ramen shop in Oxford called Edamame, and we just sat down there and we were like, well, you know, Harvard's got their own political review. Ha Harvard, Dale also has their own political review. Brown as well, but how come Oxford doesn't have one? So then I was like, surely there must be one. We went online and looked up Oxford political review. I, I vividly remember Googling it, and it came back with the following result. It was, and at the time, I think it was when Boris Johnson was challenging Theresa May for uh, the coveted seat. It was basically something along the lines of, um, Oxford political uh, battle, Theresa May and Boris Johnson locked up in an Oxford Union style battle. And I was just like, well, clearly there isn't such a thing as Oxford political review, so maybe there isn't even a market niche for us after all. So the next step underpinning this, or next step within this stage is to think about the, the marketing and the positioning. What makes us unique, what makes us special? Is it just that we have the name Oxford? Clearly not, right? So we must have an Oxford only management and we also thought about our positioning and the pieces that we have and also what we would be willing to publish and platform. And we came to the, the broad consensus amongst the three of us back then that we're not here to censor speech. We're also not here to platform terrible speech. We just run it by the qualitative standards of is it a good argument? So rather than picking a partisan stance and so-called baselines or red lines, we had no red lines or baselines. We just wanted quality argumentation. So if there were genuinely pieces of very controversial hot takes that we, we still have published them and, and platform them, we allowed them to be published because we think this encourages and invites more debate. But in contrast, we also agree that if there were just very you know, inspiring positions, that the politically correct stances and all that, with zero analysis and argument, we're not going to publish that sort of crap because they can, that can go elsewhere. You can, you can put that in like a third tier, I don't know, Facebook Tumblr rant, and that maybe that comes out well. 
in one's friendship group. We had high standards and we set high standards and it had that in mind as we went into sort of preparing and coming up with the details of it. So the second stage then was to think about how we could stop. And we started with an interview with Kevin Rudd in January 2019. And that was because we thought Kevin Rudd, given our previous affiliation with him, would be an interesting guest to interview. And interviewing him then also kick-started a series of submissions and folks pitching articles and sending them over, which we edited, processed, and published onto our website, which was back then a very rudimentary and crude website. And obviously, it was just the alpha stage of being tested. So that was the yeah. second stage, right, where we're, we're actually putting our words and visions to action, and we're not just talking about it. And here, if there's one lesson I can extrapolate from this is talk less, do more. It's always easy to think of or conceive, I guess, the process of coming with a publication and running it as, okay, let's plan it out. Let's plan it out. Let's plan out for three months. Let's plan out for six months. Let's interview people and ask them what they think about the publication. By the time you're done with planning, I mean, in the long run, we're all dead anyway. But by the time you're done with the planning, some of the team might have graduated. Some of them might have lost interest. Some of them might have just been like, screw you. You wasted one year of my life planning. Now you're telling me you want to execute this. Bollocks. So that's why we just said we're going to go straight in. Now, obviously, that does not mean that rash, impetuous decision-making was there for the norm or should be encouraged. We were by no means, we were by no means, I think, uh, hopefully that, that history proves us right, we were by no means, you know, overzealous and headstrong in terms of assessing a lot of the options that we had available to us. And I think cocksuredness is one of the worst mistakes or traits you can have when running yeah. a publication. But we undertook risks. We took up risks like committing to the website and paying for it before even having a Facebook page. We took the risk of inviting Kevin Rudd to an interview before uh, even having a sizable presence in terms of publications available or pieces published. And it worked out well. So the third stage then was to translate the publication, transform it from a stage of conception and initial implementation to expanding its reach. And that was when we introduced things like calls for submission that were posted extensively online and across different platforms. And through that, we were able to generate, I think, an interested or a pretty devoted demographic community that were willing to write it for us and also read the stuff we posted. So I think these are the three stages that may or may not be transferable or applicable to other contexts or other publications, yeah. but certainly in my opinion are, are worthwhile or hopefully would offer some worthwhile insights into how to run a publication. I can't say with confidence I know how to run it, but I can say with some confidence I know, I know how to start it. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely an important point to raise. Um, I'm coming back to the first thing you said. You, you, you broke this down into three stages. The first one is the inception, which obviously is probably the most important part of this. But oftentimes, people manage to come up with an idea. They manage to come up with a potential direction that they want to go in. But people get discouraged easily, either because they set a goal that was too big that they weren't able to reach, or some people might be genuinely intimidated from censorship, as is the case in some universities. What would you say to, uni to students that have managed to come up with the inception, just like that additional level of motivation to execute this? You have 90 years maximum, okay, 100 years maximum in your life. Uh, you have 10 decades to live through. At university, you have three years, maybe four years, and if you're really into it, five years or six years. Time is precious, but you're also precious. If you, think all, if you think all you need to do in order to let your precious, unique self come through is to sit there and wait for someone to discover you, like, like a pedestrian walking on a side road, tripping uh, because, or tripping over this, this cobblestone or this, this rock that juts out, and you're like, voila, I'll be recognized because I'll be a diamond. And if you stumble upon the diamond, the diamond will shine. Then, my friend, you really are quite a... Cherubic, I think I applaud you for your optimism. I applaud you for lots of reasons. Uh, yes. But the reality is opportunities don't come to you like that. It doesn't work that way. The world doesn't work in a way that revolves around you. If you don't enter or find a way to insert yourself into the world, the world is going to insert you into the crevice of irrelevance. And that is why, in my opinion, yes, you might be afraid, and I think there are good reasons to be afraid of certain universities for censorship. 
self-censorship and mob rule or mob pressures are increasingly the norm. But we must also recognize that at the end of the day, opportunities are only available to those who seize carpe diem. This is an old, old sort of mantra. And I can't believe I'm saying it because, well, it is uttered by my third favorite actor in my second favorite movie of all time, Dead Poet Society. But at the very same time, it is true. Try it out. And if it doesn't work, what have you lost? What have you lost? Yeah. You've so lost all time, okay? To just try it out. That's something yeah. that a lot of people never try. It's like, the goal is to just get started, and who knows, from there it might turn out to be okay. And when but you try, it you might work, not succeed. Then... Yeah. If you try, you might not succeed. When you try so hard and you don't succeed, this is what Coldplay talks about, you know? When they want to fix you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 All That's right. a good um, tune in it. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. So coming back to student journalism. So this might be something that w we discussed in brief earlier, but I want to get into more detail right now. There are there is a genuine debate circulating the efficacy of this, right? Like how how much can student journalists really get done, or any student think tank or uh, political organization like yours? So why do you think having these organizations are necessary? Like, why are they important? What exactly do they achieve in today's society? The youth are in some way, shape or form, inevitably going to be our future. Mm -hmm. The youth think tanks and publications that we see today would inevitably become the guiding forces for think tanks, discourse, intellectual work, exploration in decades time the youth value is not necessarily cashable or cash outable if that's a phrase at the present but eventually the value comes through and it comes through very quickly especially in an age like ours where it's like ghost is anti-establishment anti-authority and just resisting the hegemony dominance of the old the privileged and the powerful. The youth today in 2020 played a pivotal role of counterbalancing against some of the most pernicious narratives, and I'm not naming any particular generations here, some of those pernicious narratives and forces that govern our structures or our social structures today, whether it be in the East, whether it be in the West. And therefore, the youth doesn't just have a generational and inevitable role, but also they have a role that's defined by this epoch by this period of the 2020s, the roaring 20s, the 20s where viruses are roaring, where wars are roaring, where systemic racism is certainly roaring, and where authoritarian abuses of human rights remain persistent and persevering today. And that is where I think the youth comes in, because the role of the youth is to speak, but also to learn, and to integrate learning with speaking, to transform yeah. the way through learning from the peers, learning from others, learning from the seniors and the elders, but also to learn through speaking, through trial and error, through trial and error, sorry. And here yeah. I actually think there's an important lesson to learn, especially from Domainer's point of view. And this is where it might not be a popular opinion, but I'm going to say this anyway. I've spoken to a lot of debaters. I myself am a debater. I've spoken with a lot of debaters at tournaments. I've attended more tournaments, I think, than any other human being alive. Apart from, maybe Harish apart from maybe Harish Nadarajan, apart from maybe Mr. Harish Nadarajan, our good friend, good friend. But I think debaters often think that if you see a problem, you speak out, you post about it, you write about it, and then voila, it goes away. I think that's nice. That's a nice fair. Sorry, that, that, that's a nice narrative to, to keep selling, and it, it certainly reinforces and legitimizes the necessity of debating. But in my opinion. The more I've experienced events that happen around me, the more I'm convinced that that's not how it works. Here, here's an intuitive example. You work in a company. You see that your boss has exploited your colleague and your coworker. Your boss is also very powerful, you know, entrenches the influence and is likely to fire both you and your colleague if you speak out now in the most public and visceral way possible. And yet you choose to speak out because you want to speak truth to power. And you say, I'm the youth. Fight me, and the boss fights you. 
like metaphorically, not not literally, because I would land him in jail. He sacks yeah. you and sacks the person you're trying to protect. That's scenario one. Scenario two, you work your way up to a certain level, and then you, you, you tell your colleague, why don't we draft a petition that alongside all of the other departments, we draft a petition to the boss above the boss. And through that, you invoke the opportunity to, to sack your boss. You might not speak out publicly about it, but you're doing something about it. And that's important. And obviously, cherubic youth often have that privilege and opportunity to speak their minds, and especially in universities, even though I do fear that that's increasingly not the case anymore, to some extent. But the, the downside to that is speaking your mind also lands others and a lot of others by that, not just your, your closest peers, but also others who matter. You land them in deep trouble. And that is why I think as youth, what's important to bear in mind is there's so much for you to learn. It doesn't mean you do nothing. But sometimes doing something doesn't mean speaking out about it. It also doesn't mean, however, that you remain silent on everything. I think it needs to be Correct. a series or it needs to be calibrated carefully under the paradigm of pragmatic yeah. idealism. But, but, but what, I, about, what I want to ask about, if I can interject, is there are yeah. definitely long-term benefits that come as a result of this, right? Like, for example, obviously the trial and error process of running a student political organization is important because you learn what works and what doesn't work. Now, yep. what I want to ask you about is the immediate effects. What are the immediate impacts that student journalism can have on, let's say, not just like in society, but within the campus itself? Are there any meaningful changes that it can bring about almost immediately? And are there any examples you could cite? Um, I mean, I was going to say the most immediate impact is you get a very, very tight editorial team. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, um, on the less serious, or on a more serious note, sorry, I'd say, <laughs> I think you, so, so here's my commentary and observation from the Oxford student journalism sphere. As much as you might, or folks who are prudish about publications might hold their noses up high and be like, oh, ew, this is a new publication, that's bad. Regardless of what you think or make of a new publication, every new publication adds something to the bio. Unless they're a complete rip-off, in which case, well, uh, jog on to those yeah. uh, opportunities, right? But in general, you know, there, there's always value in, in a new publication, yeah. regardless of what they're doing, how well they're doing it. You know, if they're not doing journalism well, then it's a counterexample. It's, it's an example that you want to stay away from. You want to stay well clear and tragic for it. But if it's some publication that specializes very well in particular niche and does, does it incredibly well, but that, I think, also forces other and compels other publications to readjust their priorities and also new modes of reporting, maybe diversify the publication, to render, to engage with a, a more eclectic range of topics, to engage with a more eclectic range of authors and writers and people. It's always, you know, it's generally a benign effect. I would call this the catfish effect, because if you've studied, say, MBA or management, you would know the term catfish effect, where you put a catfish in a pool of fish, the catfish stimulates the other fish to, to start swimming about, and, that, and that's how you get competition. So it's a virtuous cycle. You know, with more competition, you get more interest and more willingness to participate, and you never lower the perceived and actual barriers to entry as well concurrently, and you get more competition again coming in. So it's a virtuous cycle yeah. there. Yeah. So that cycle can definitely happen if, like, not just within a university, but let's say even within a country, if one student organization was able to get influence, surely would spark more from, uh, it would spark more to participate in and add on to that cycle. And I think that's a pretty interesting point, which is that insofar as someone actually starts, let's say their own political review or their own like student led journalism group or, or even a student podcast, that might be the catalyst for other universities to start their podcast. And I hope anyone who is listening coming from a university who is thinking of starting something similar, this has been productive in actually being able to encourage you in going forward with it. Now, going forward, uh, specifically on something that you talked about on censorship. So now technology obviously continues to alter journalism in a way in which we have not seen before. But I wanna focus on one aspect of it in particular, which is social media and potential censorship and regulation that happens there. What do you think its effects are in journalism? You've got to get creative. You've got to get creative, mate. The reality is um, censorship is everywhere. Self-censorship, actual censorship, official censorship, uh, soft censorship, corporate media induced censorship. I'm quoting Noam Chomsky here in terms of these five layers of models, or his uh, five tiers of media analysis involving 
course, they're both uh, concerns and preoccupations with capitalism and also sources of social, whatever. All of these are, um, in my opinion, very tenacious effects. That they're persistent and they're also pernicious. But the, the answer to it is that the three possible responses you take to it. The first is you don't, you know, censor or play by the rules. You get arrested or you get screwed over. The second is you completely self-censor and you decide to not write about important issues and you only go to la-la land and you, you, you basically have an ideological uh, fantasy. Uh, and I perfectly respect that because at the end of the day, la-la land writing is still very much appreciated and is incredibly important. The third, and this is the most challenging route, you... You selectively self-censor. You play it. You play with the censorship game, but you play with it in a way that allows you to convey the actual messages you want to and you should stand for. That I yeah. think is what I call oblique writing, and also some of the most challenging and difficult sort of aspects of political writing that folks might have to get used to increasingly in an increasingly ideologically polarized and de facto censored world. Right, and and in my opinion. We, we don't like to live with the reality of censorship, but unless you're strong enough to change and topple the political order, you have to live with it. The question is, do you make good yeah. use of that space you have available to you, or do you instead simply squander it by chatting about completely irrelevant and socially disutile or just socially futile right. content? Right. How exactly do you get creative when it comes to censorship? Think about the mentality of those engaging with censorship and then think about how you can write and circumvent and cut corners. If you believe that this publication loves capitalism, loves free market liberals, then you can always package socialist ideals in ways that are palatable and amenable to capitalist audiences. Like 10 ways in which this particular middle class individual became the best man ever in the history of his little town. Click him to find out why. No, I'm not suggesting you do quick things, but I'm suggesting that you are you, you be dexterous. You transform the language you use. You couch the gender in particular ways that satisfy and placate the audiences you need to get to. And that's fundamentally, in my opinion, what's so important about oblique writing. You, know, you have an understanding of what you're trying to achieve and you go for it. Mm -hmm. You don't need to care about how others think of you writing or perceive your writing. Whatever they like to do is it's up to them. You can't control what those who are irrelevant to you think of you. But you can't control what those who are relevant to you think of you. And you should do that as well, because that's indeed the target demographic of your own I think that's sort of my main advice there. And, and do you think it's getting increasingly more difficult to become creative? Well, how do you get creative? Well, yeah. that's a great question. And, and if I, if it's, it's becoming, becoming, it's becoming if I can be honest with you, I, I, I don't know the answer. I, I really don't know the answer. I make no experiments. Because I think to me, creativity is kind of like kind of like an 87 speech and debating. It, you either get it or you don't, and it comes and goes, and it's just, it's about inspiration. It's about being in a zone. Mm -hmm. And I know, I hate to sound so mystic, but I, I know this sounds really mystic and it sounds like Trelawney from Harry Potter, if that's a permissible or permissible reference still. Um, but but effectively, you know, I just think, it, it's really hard to articulate how you get creative because of two reasons. One, each and every individual's journey towards creativity and writers or overcoming writers' block is unique and different. And two, and perhaps more importantly, creativity is always a relativized process. Picasso was creative back then. If someone Picasso's a piece of artwork now, it's not particularly creative. It is creative to think of arguments like Rousseau's analysis of the social contract, Rawls' analysis of the veil of ignorance at their time. It is no longer creative today. It is creative within a particular community to come up with an example that only, and indeed only that community has not heard of or thought of, but instead it might be proliferate in a community all around the world. But you would still say that that man is creative because it is conceived in a way where what's produced is disparate and sufficiently distinct and non-replicatable or, or derivatively generated rather, from the substance in which he is situated. That is creativity. It is the Definitely. production of the new surrounded by the old. But if there's no such thing as a surrounding or the environment of the old, then there's no such thing as new, because new is always relativized against the past, the present against the past, the future against the present. All of this long winded sort of equatious rant is not to say I have no answer, it's just to say I really don't know the answer. 
but I would say one quick yeah. thing, and it was indeed one tip I'd give. Creativity is about drawing links and associations, for me at least, between points and ideas and concepts that you traditionally don't associate with one another. So what do you think is the relationship between a chocolate pudding and democracy? Hint, hint. Both of them, if you have too much of it, could well kill you. <laughs> oh, that was a joke. <laughs> but I think it's important to think about associations and correlations as such. Because finding associations and links between unfamiliar or defamiliarized objects and also problematizing pre-established assumptions, that to me is the quickest and easiest way to get creative. Because it necessarily pushes itself or forces itself against the backlog of established or, or, or so-called established uh, stylized facts. It pushes itself against the backdrop and therefore, by definition, must be creative. Is it creatively destructive or creatively constructive? Yeah. That's a question that must be answered separately. For sure. Um, all right, I'd like to come to one last thing. Now, given that we've discussed extensively all sorts of things that the Oxford Political Review has done, and all sorts of things that constitute student journalism and how it differs from other forms of student bodies that talk about politics. So we've had an extremely fruitful discussion. The final thing I'd like to ask is, what has the OPR managed to do to encourage more student journalists, or at the very least encourage more student participation in politics within the University of Oxford or even in any other university? I think it's the online digital sphere, which we're tapping into more aggressively ramping up over the summer, so certainly keep an eye out for that. OPR currently has 3,000 Twitter followers. Uh, that is uh, roughly twice the amount we had at the beginning of June. Our aim by the end of summer is to get to 20,000. I think the power of the digital media sphere is one such that we can empower like-minded folks to come together to coalesce and rally around this common goals. Maybe this cause isn't obvious. Maybe this cause is heterogeneous in kind and at its core. But this is a court that is fundamentally upheld by a set of common convictions. That we all have voices, we all have things to talk about, to share, and we deserve to have them heard. Now there's no such thing as automatically granting of automatic granting of rights based on your research. You deserve to drink water, yeah. it doesn't mean you have access to water. I deserve to have my voice platform, it doesn't mean that my voice is platform. And that's why OPR seeks to close this normative empirical gap. We want to provide that platform that empowers those who deserve to be heard and allows them to actually be heard. And that, I think, is what we are fundamentally propelled by and driven by. And, uh, well, sense? yeah, it made perfect sense. I wish you all the luck in OPR's future. Thank Brian, you, Rome, thank you so you. much for joining us today. We had an amazing discussion. Thank you for having me. And I hope to see you soon when I next fly over to KL, um, wherever that may be. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah definitely, definitely. It might be after your general election. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Like, no one really knows. But I really look forward to seeing you in some time in the future. Uh, Brian Wong, everyone, you can follow the OPR on social media. The Oxford Political Review still does a lot of work, and a lot of, it does a lot of really good work. Uh, do also follow Beyond Seven Minutes on social media. You'll be heard. I sure will. Back. Yeah, we'll definitely have a lot more interviews planned for the future. Uh, follow us on Instagram. Yeah, so thank you so much for joining us and wish you all the best. Thank Thanks. you, Brian. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye, Brian.